Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If any of you kids ever want to get an A in your English class, I've got a great word for you that you can put into one of your papers. And that word is juxtaposition. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this term, juxtaposition is what happens when a writer holds two things up in order to contrast them and highlight their differences. Juxtaposition is a word I've used many times on many papers. I majored in, in English in college, so I can guarantee you it works wonders. And there is, of course, a great example of juxtaposition going on in Luke chapter 18. So in the middle of the chapter, before our words for today from our gospel reading, Luke tells us about the rich young ruler, the man who comes to Jesus asking him what he must do to inherit eternal life. So after confidently telling Christ that he's kept all of the commandments, he goes away brokenhearted when Jesus tells him to give all of his money to the poor and to come follow him if he wants eternal life. Then at the end of the chapter, as we heard in our gospel reading, after Jesus foretells his, de his death for the third time, Luke tells us about this blind beggar, the man who cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This man who recovers his sight through Jesus' miracle and who ends up following our Lord. So what is Luke trying to highlight when he juxtaposes these two men? What does he want us to see by linking them on either end of Christ's words about his being put to death and rising again on the third day? Well, ultimately, Luke wants us to see what faith looks like and what it doesn't look like. He wants us to see what it means to leave everything we have and follow Jesus. So just like the devil, the world likes to tell us half-truths. And the world has told this rich young ruler half of the truth. It's told him that God loves him, that God cherishes him, and wants to claim him as his own son for all of eternity. But the world hasn't told this man that the love of God comes from the blood of Christ, as the scriptures proclaim. It doesn't tell him that the only thing that will make him holy is in fact the holiness of God's own son being given to him. Rather, the world has convinced this young man that, he, that his wealth, that he has produced that holiness himself and that his money, his wealth, and his possessions serve as proof of that. So surely God must love you, the world tells him. Look at how greatly he's blessed you. Look at all the things that you have, all of the people you want, who want to be around you. Surely this is all proof that you are pious and holy enough for God, that you've perfectly kept the commandments that will bring you eternal life. So when this young man looks at his wealth, he sees proof of his righteousness, proof that he has something to offer to God. This is why when he comes to Jesus with this question about what he must do to inherit eternal life, he's not asking because he doesn't know the answer. He's asking because he thinks he has the answer, that he himself is the answer, that in his possessions and wealth he has the proof that he is already worthy of eternal life and he simply wants to see if Jesus will confirm him in this. But when Christ looks at this man's wealth, he sees it as proof of this man's slavery rather than his righteous. Proof that this man has nothing to offer God but his sin. And so, when Jesus invites this man to sell everything and follow him, he's essentially saying to him, what the world has told you is a lie. You have nothing. You are not righteous or holy. So let go of the lies that your wealth has told you to enslave you and come discover true freedom and true righteousness with me. Get rid of the possessions that can't save you and come follow me to the cross where I will save you. But because the man believes the world over Christ, he won't follow Jesus, won't have faith in him and therefore won't be saved. Because he'd rather believe what the world tells him, he remains in darkness and condemnation. So then, what do we see in that blind beggar, identified by the name of Bartimaeus in Mark's Gospel? 
Well, again, the world has also told this man a half-truth. The world has said, the scriptures tell you that you're a sinner, that you are lost and condemned. And then here comes the lie, and and that you have no reason to expect God to care about you, to forgive you, or to show you his mercy. And the proof of these things is found in your blindness, in the fact that God has left you begging for crumbs on the side of the road, and the fact that the world wants nothing to do with you, that the world looks at you and sees someone to be scorned and pitied, there is the proof that God has no interest in loving you. But the blind man doesn't believe the world. He believes the word of God, which has promised him that the Messiah, the one who is the son of David, it will come to give sight to the blind, to give healing to the sick, and to give salvation to the condemned sinners like him. So when he hears that this Messiah, the son of David, Jesus, is drawing near, the same son of David who's healed so many already, he cries out to that son of David and asks for mercy, asks for something that lowly sinners like him don't deserve, but that God has promised to give them. And so, in performing the miracle, Jesus is ultimately saying to this man, you are quite right. What the world has told you is not true. God has not forgotten you. He hasn't abandoned you or refused to give you his love. He has remembered his promises in me. So come follow me to the cross, and I will give you the love of God and eternal life. Open your eyes and watch as I'm crucified and as I burst forth from the tomb and I will give you the right to look upon the face of your father forever. And this is exactly what Bartimaeus does. So here's the point that Luke is making in this act of juxtaposition. The point he's making in contrasting these two very different and yet similar men. If you want eternal life, You must follow Jesus to the cross. And you can't follow him until you believe him over the world. So like that rich young man, the world tells you that you are holy, that in and of yourself you are without sin and that you are worthy of everything God has to give. The world looks at you and says, look at your life. Look at the level of comfort you have, the prosperity that surrounds you. Look at all of these people. Look at how you've never struggled to find a meal or worried about where you'd sleep at night. Look at all of the people you have in your life who love you, who want to be around you, who enjoy your company, who declare in every action that they have that you are a good person. This is proof that you are righteous, that you've done enough to earn eternal life from God. You don't need anything else to make yourself pleasing to him. Or, like the blind beggar, the world tells you that you are worthless, that you have no value, that God has forgotten you and you shouldn't expect any love from him, or, for that matter, from your fellow man. So the world says when people ignore you, when they trample over your heart, when they mistreat you and abuse you, then you shouldn't expect God to give you anything better or anything at all. There the world tells you that you should just get used to living in despair. So then Jesus comes along and he tells you to let go of the world's lies. When you are immersed in pride, Jesus comes along and tells you that you don't actually deserve salvation, which is proved by the nail marks in his hands, that you have failed miserably to make yourself pleasing to God as evidenced by the crown of thorns pushed into his brow. Jesus says to you that all the evidence you thought you had that you were a good person who deserved eternal life is nothing but vapor and deceit. So let go of the world's lies. Let go of the illusion. Cast off the shackles of of this shame and despair and come follow him to the cross. Come follow him to the place where he will in fact give you the righteousness you never really had. The holiness that comes from his veins and makes you worthy of eternal life. And when you are immersed in despair, 
Jesus bids you to follow him to the same location. So when the world has torn you down and ripped you apart, Jesus comes to you and says that you are not nothing because he has chosen to give you everything on account of his Father's love for you. When the world screams that you can't possibly expect God to love you, Jesus tells you the truth, that you can and should expect God to shower you in his love because he is going to shower you in his blood at Calvary. So come follow him there. Come follow him to the place where he will give you the love the world has never shown you, the love that will last forever. So either way, whatever the world tells you is not true. Either way, let go of the world's lies and follow Christ to Calvary, because it's there that both rich young men and poor blind beggars find their salvation. So if you have everything you want in this life, all of the money, all of the comfort, all of the fulfillment and satisfaction, don't believe for a second that you have everything you need. You don't. You need the perfect obedience to the commandments that only Jesus can give, and he gives it at the cross. You need the righteousness of God that you cannot manufacture. You need the holiness that your sinful hands and heart can't create. But Jesus can create this. He has created it, and he has given you the right to claim it through his death and resurrection. So don't believe the world. Sell everything that the world has told you. Go to the cross and see the the nail-pierced hands of Jesus, and there you will see that you have everything you need to inherit eternal life. There in his blood, your sins, your pride, your self-righteousness have all been taken away, drowned in his mercy. There, as Jesus is buried in the grave, he buries your sins along with him. And there, as Jesus bursts forth from the tomb on Easter Sunday, there he shows you that you now have the right to live forever. So leave the world's lies behind. Confess your sins. Receive Christ's absolution. Follow him to the bloody cross and the empty tomb. And there you will have eternal life. And if you have nothing in this world, if you're still struggling to put food on the table, if those you love have turned against you, if you find yourself devoured by loneliness and rejection, don't believe for a second that you are worthless or that God has forgotten you. You aren't. And he hasn't. He has remembered his love for you, remembered his promise to be your savior. And so he sent his only begotten son into the flesh and into this world to give you these treasures. So follow Christ to Calvary and there you will find them. Like Bartimaeus, wipe the blindness from your eyes. Open them and look as Christ breathes out his last upon the cross. And there you will see how valuable you are to your Father in heaven. You are worth more to him than all of the silver and gold of this world, which is why he's giving up for you his only begotten son to make you his own. For your God, heaven is empty without you. And so he sent Christ to pour out his blood upon the cross, the blood that kills your sinful hearts gives you a perfect heart and makes you holy and worthy to enter his kingdom and to live with him forever. There, as Jesus cries out, it is finished. He is proclaiming that he has completed the process of making you worthy to enter his father's arms forever. And as Jesus walks out of the grave alive on the third day, there he is giving you the right to let go of the world and to fall into the safety of those divine arms in every single day of your life. So do it. Let go of the world. If your possessions keep convincing you that you don't need Christ, then sell every single one of them and give everything away until you know that you are nothing but a beggar without the salvation of Jesus. 
And if your poverty, your brokenness are screaming that you shouldn't expect anything from God, leave those lies behind as well and rejoice to receive all of God's riches in the death and resurrection of Christ. There in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your lowliness, come and sit in the very front row of the church every single Sunday and with joy be the first to receive the body and blood of Jesus, knowing that while the world may not value you, your Father in heaven does because Christ has given him everything that you need to be valued through his pierced hands and feet. Follow Jesus to Calvary. Give up everything of this world and follow him to the empty tomb. Believe his words, and there you will have all the treasure, all the glory, and all the peace that the world cannot give, but that Christ will never stop making your own. Amen.